Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. I would like to welcome you. Um, first, a quick uh, word about the translation. Si quieres escuchar este webinar, si quieres escuchar este webinar en español, por favor, haz clic en el globo de la parte in inferior de tu pantalla y hab habilita la traducción a español, por favor. So, that's for the Spanish speaker audience. Um, so now it's, uh, I would like to officially open the webinar. Um, welcome, my name is Twan van Gerwe and I am the head of global technical management poultry within EW Nutrition. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce our two exceptional presenters. First, we have Gordon Butland in the past Gordon was poultry sector industry analyst at Rabobank International, also chief financial officer at the Anglo-American Group, Brazil. And he is currently with GNS Agri Consultant as an advisor on strategy and data analysis for companies along the entire poultry chain on all continents of the world. So with this background, you can imagine the level of practical and solution-oriented expertise of today's today's first presenter. Hello, uh, everyone. Good to be here. Thank you. And next, we have Professor Jaap Wagenaar. Professor Wagenaar has worked with the World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control in the U.S., and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He's chair of the Clinical Infectious Diseases at um, Utrecht University in the Netherlands and director of the Collaborating Center for Campy Campylobacter of the World Health Organization and the OIE Reference Laboratory for Campy Campylobacteriosis. He frequently acts as an expert for WHO, FAO, and OIA, OIE. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, with me, I have one panelist who will support this webinar with both content and technical issues. So, Jurek Grappentin, uh, please introduce yourself too. Good evening and welcome from Singapore. My name is Jurek Grappentin, and AMR is for me a personal important topic because I'm concerned for the well being, my future well being of my firstborn son who just turned six months. Besides being a father, I'm a regional director for Southeast Asia Pacific for EW Nutrition, and I'm supporting today as a panelist during the webinar. Thank you. For the four of us together, we'll help answer questions during and after the presentations. Questions can be asked throughout the webinar in the Q&A panel, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. So some will be receiving instant replies from us, and some will be picked up and answered in the live Q&A session that will follow the presentations. So now let's roll with the first presentation. Gordon, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody from Bangkok. And thank you to EW Nutrition for inviting me to speak on to this uh, very important from an industry and a personal point of view also. So I'm going to speak on the business opportunities uh, for animal production with reduced using reduced antimicrobials. So I'm a financial person. So why listen to financial advisors? Well, technical experts assess and monitor the KPIs, but the market dictates what the KPIs are. And banks, investors, and stock market both reflect and influence the market. So I've been in the protein industry for 30 years. I talk to investors, stock market analysts, and banks constantly. And on the other side, I also cover on a day-to-day -day basis in Brazil and in Asia, operational physical performance and costs. So the financial community is watching us. I first came into contact with this subject uh, coming into uh, the financial side of, the, of poultry. Uh, in the USA, about four or five years ago, a major USA poultry uh, company uh, invited to give the keynote speaker for their investment day to a food safety uh, expert 
from a major uh, a global animal health product company. And the title of the presentation was Change, Challenge and Opportunity on reframing the conversation about the use of antibiotics in animal agriculture. Uh, this was very uh, interesting. Everybody was a little bit surprised that we would have a technical person in a financial uh, 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 presentation. And a few weeks after, I was then involved in a conference for stock market analysts with a research house. And many, many questions were being asked about what the companies were doing with their antibiotic strategy and what the situation, what was going to be the effect on their bottom line. So you can see your market value is increasingly assessed based on this indicator also, and not just your financial uh, uh, results. And also for people who are in the less developed part of the world who are looking for finance quite often from uh, uh, from institution, financial institutions such as the World Bank or FAO, uh, FMO from uh, the Netherlands, they will today be looking for uh, uh, compliance, technical compliance, as well as financial compliance. In the past, they've been looking at animal welfare and environmental issues, and I am sure that antibiotic use will be added to their, to their list that you will have to comply with. And the industry, has reacted and is still reacting. You see from this uh, 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 graph here, from the progress from 2014 to 2019, and in 2014, only 3% of the uh, birds slaughtered were uh, the no antibiotic ever. And in 2019, they were 58%. And diving a little bit deeper of the, the smaller birds, i.e. birds which are basically under 2.5, 2.7 kilos, that was 100% that number. So the, 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 the blue, the reduced use ionophores, et cetera, were only being used in the bigger birds that spent more time in, in production. And we can't forget that it's a consumer that's got, uh, that has been leading the, the, the requirements and even more in the future. And in the US, there is a company, uh, Chain Reaction, and they have this scorecard every year. So you see on the left-hand side in 2016, uh, and this is when they, they were uh, doing the scorecard based on all the proteins being used. And only two managed to get in the A category and then some very famous names in the B and C plus. And then in 2019, they've actually then only concentrated on beef and this indicates to me, as did the graph uh, uh, that we just showed before, that they, the, the poultry section has, has very well complied with the reduction, but the beef sector, which is rather more difficult, <coughs> still has a long way to go. And the consumers, they, they, they want more and more today. Uh, we've said for many, many years that it, uh, the, the industry is from farm to fork. But I would argue today that is increasingly it's more from fork to farm. Why? People want to know what's in the product. They want clear labeling. They want to know where the product comes from, how it's produced, the effect on environment and even human uh, 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 welfare also in the industry. So now it's very clearly fork to farm. And also consumer habits are changing all the time. And COVID, in my opinion, has accelerated and is still accelerating that change of habits. I've split down here into four uh, age demographics. Uh, sometimes we talk about millennials and seniors and, and baby boomers, et cetera, but I've split here by four age groups. And there's no doubt in my mind that the two categories below 24 years old, which make up 41% of the population, uh, these are the, the activists, they are, uh, looking for information all the time. And in the younger categories, you even see that there's now a lot of education in schools, universities, but all around the world, not just in the developing, uh, in the developed countries. And then on the other end of the scale, those of us who are uh, older, we are hoping to live forever. So we have become very, very much wellness conscious also. 
So these are the reasons that you need to future-proof your business. So you have the, the QSR, the consumer point of sale demand, uh, McDonald's, and they're making have been making big changes to their to their burgers. You have the retailers, Tesco, Aldi in Europe, Walmart in the USA. You have the the major players in industry setting very very high standards. Purdue, they have now completely removing all antibiotics from every part of their cha chain. And then and you have the regulations themselves, where even China, uh, they have got a plan to reduce them. This plan is already in, in progress to reduce the use of antibiotics on farms. So we have the consumer, we have the industry standards, and we have the regulators. Now, we do have one problem. The industry is a little bit reacting and not leading. Uh, we've all been told during COVID that we should listen to science. Um, sometimes science is a bit um, confusing uh, or, or it's not, there's not a consensus. Now, this is acceptable, I think, from COVID because it's a new disease. We still don't have all the information. But antibiotic, this issue has been around for more than a decade, and it's about time that we have some a consensus on uh, what is permitted, what isn't permitted. Now, in the USA, the uh, on the label, if it's got a USDA, FA, FDA approval, the consumer, in most cases, then is confident that it, it's okay. We don't have such a, uh, an authority in, in Europe, and quite often it's the, the retailers that are looked upon by the consumer to look after their interest. And Tesco is part of the, uh, the initiative uh, on antibiotic, antimicrobial use. As you see, here's a, uh, an example from one of their presentations where they are monitoring over the year. And you see this very big improvement from 2015 to 2020. And then below this, they actually have a graph by each of their of country from where they have their supplier, uh, uh, every country in the EU. And then they have one for the rest of the world. And the rest of the world basically is Thailand and Brazil, who are the big suppliers uh, into the European Union. And um, I am happy to say that uh, in Thailand and Brazil, uh, we are actually lower than most of the European countries. So what are the possible consequences of this uh, uh, ABR? Um, FCR would go up by two to six points because of impaired gut health unless other things were done. So you would have to have the adequate feed additives and proper nutrition programs. Disease and mortality has been going up by one to 2%, basically necrotic enteritis. Then the feed additives again, adequate or, or good day old chick quality, vaccination, and certainly all in and all out biosecurity. And then finally here, you. Uh, there is a tendency for more wet litter, and that leads to bad dermatitis. And there again, biosecurity, nutrition, feed additives has to be used to mitigate. So overall, the net effect, your productivity might reduce between 5 to 7% as stocking density has to reduce and downtimes increase. So you need a combination of most of these interventions to uh, mitigate the the increase in costs. Now, there are also opportunities, not just a, a cost issue. Uh, there's a, a, a chance to get a brand equity uh, where you capture new markets, especially with the young generation who are you now becoming buyers themselves. And you have the long-term survival and people will, will have to balance the cost of doing nothing against the cost of future proofing. Um, I think from, from uh, my experience, uh, if you are supplying into the major US or, or European markets, you, cut, you will not be allowed to do nothing. You will just uh, uh, not be allowed to supply those markets. So ABR will become a license to produce, that is a way to stay in business, even in underdeveloped countries. And there's a short term marketing opportunity for global, to global buyers. But of course, when everybody uh, uh, follows and everybody becomes uh, antibiotic, uh, no antibiotic ever, then those premiums will uh, uh, fall away a little bit. 
Now, the, the decision should not be around if ABR should be done. That's not how it's going to work. But you have to concentrate on how to offset potential cost to you and the end consumer. This is a case study from, uh, from Thailand, the Thai company Better Grow. These products were taken off a supermarket shelf during the weekend, and they're building up a long-term brand strategy around this brand, Espure. And it's all RWA, raised without antibiotics, and you see there, duly certified by a global certifying body. And at the moment, these products are priced with a significant premium of over 50%. So to terminate a conclusion, there was a, an excellent study done between 2013, 2017 by the USDA in the USA on about 8 billion broilers, which is over 80% of US productions. And there the vet of each company, they had to go into all their records and they had to indicate what antibiotic was used, at what age of the bird they used it, and what was the, uh, the incident, what was the, the, the disease issue that had to use the specific antibiotic that was used. And they've come up at the end of the, the, their, their study, their report on the study is saying that while reducing the total grams of antimicrobials used is an important step in mitigating antimicrobial resistance, reducing the need for such use should be considered a more appropriate objective. So with that, Thank you very much. And I pass on, pass back to the, to the moderator. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I will directly um, um, move over to Yap. Thank you, Gordon. Um, now move over to, to Yap to start his presentation. Yeah. Professor Wagner. Yeah, it's happening almost there. <laughs> Three. Whoa. Yeah, again. Yeah. So I hope that you can uh, see my screen. Um, I like to talk about the reduction of antimicrobial use and uh, about the challenges and opportunities for uh, the implementation. I will do that uh, also on behalf of my colleague, uh, David Specksnyder. The outline of my talk is uh, first about why to reduce antimicrobial use, then the options for reduction, decrease of antimicrobial use in Europe, we already heard something about it in the former speaker, about the sustainability of the AMR mitigation, and then uh, at the end, some points for discussion. And I use two abbreviations throughout my presentation. One is AMR, what stands for antimicrobial resistance, and the other one is AMU, what stands for antimicrobial use. The problem of antimicrobial resistance is, is a huge global problem, but in fact, it's, it's, it's captured the, the problem and the solution in this, uh, in this picture. What you see in this picture is um, uh, chicken <laughs> uh, that are exposed to antimicrobials. And when they are exposed to antimicrobials, you see here the red dots, what means that that are resistant microorganisms. They are everywhere, but they are really in, an, in a minority. And we almost never find them until you expose the animals to antimicrobials. And what you see is that you have a selection of the few resistant microorganisms and they start amplifying and they have nutrients because the susceptible ones are killed. And then the next step is that these resistant microorganisms, they can spread to uh, to the other animals in the same flock or to, to other houses or to other farms or to humans. And at the bottom here, you see what interventions can be done. The main intervention is the reduction of antimicrobial use because that prevents the exposure to antimicrobials. And the second one is the infection control and that reduces the spread. Now we are doing that at the animal side with uh, biosecurity on farms. Uh, in a whole production chain. And uh, also at the human side, they are doing that. And then we call it infection prevention and control. They are doing that in, in hospitals uh, and in healthcare facilities. But we are, we are talking about reduction of antimicrobial use, but 
what is in for the producer and the farmer. And one of the drivers of the, of the whole uh, issue of, of antimicrobial resistance is that there is a problem in public health, there is a problem in the human side. And so, and definitely the animal side and the human side are connected when we are talking about bacteria and when we are talking about resistant bacteria. But still the question is there, how much uh, influence does the, the animal side has on the, uh, on the human health? Now for foodborne pathogens, there is no doubt that uh, there is a transfer of, for example, resistant salmonella or resistant campylobacter from animal production to humans. But for other uh, resistant mechanisms, and, and uh, we are talking about the ESBLs, you might have heard of it in the in E. coli, then there is a different story. And we, in fact, we do not really exactly know how much is transferred from animals to humans. But still, I think even when it's not a lot, I think we have the need to work at the animal side. And I think what is important is that we keep on the communication with the human side, because it's a job that we have to do together. More important maybe for producers is the benefits in the animal health. And then the, the question is, what are the costs of antimicrobial resistance in animal production? Now, there are not, not good estimates, but we heard already in the former presentation that there are definitely costs because of uh, treatment failure. Uh, and when you use antimicrobials, you get also in the animal pathogens, you get resistance. And in the next flock, you might have problems with, uh, with your treatment. Another benefit can be the higher value of products with the critical consumers, like the never antimicrobials ever, or what you see is uh, that um, uh, McDonald's they are asking for, uh, for flocks that are not treated with critically important antimicrobials like the fluoroquinolones. So you have a higher value of your product. But an, an important question is how to convince the producers and farmers that a further reduction of AMU is needed. And that's in my uh, next slide. So in fact, what, what is required to make that difference? First of all, it's the motivation of the producers and farmers to take the risk of avoiding the use of antimicrobials. We're doing quite some work in, in Indonesia where we are working with the producers. And really when it comes to the point of, we know what you are using, but we ask you now to avoid use, they always come up with, with questions like, why should I do this? Now, what, one of the questions, one of the answers we have is, uh, think about the resistance also in the animal pathogens because that's the profit for you. And what is the alternative? There is overuse, use that is not needed, but there is definitely use that we need to keep animals healthy. And we can partly re uh, replace the antimicrobials with alternatives. Now, there are many alternatives on the market and they are not all uh, as good. So uh, when, you, when you are looking for these alternatives, be critical there. And will it affect my profitability? Uh, that's also what was mentioned in the former presentation. Uh, it has its, uh, you get more, uh, uh, you get an high, can get an higher income when you have uh, less antimicrobial resistance. But it's always a trade off. I think it's very important to communicate about to farmers and producers about animal health instead of the public health. Because we have done it in the Netherlands. Uh, since about a decade and talking only to the farmers on the, the need to reduce because of public health. And finally, farmers, they more or less they say, yeah, but we don't see the effect or if you are not able to show the effect, why should we do the investment? I think it's important to improve animal health. That's the central question. And that was also from the FDA report. From, it's, it's very important to prevent the use of, uh, that, that there is a need for the use of antimicrobials. So I, I personally believe that we really have to invest in animal health and as a second outcome, we will have a uh, reduction of antimicrobial use. And of course, when we start talking about reduction, it's important to know what is overuse and what is misuse. In uh, the Netherlands and now also in, in uh, talking in Europe, uh, preventive use is, uh, said as, is considered as misuse. Um, of, of uh, antimicrobials, but of course there is use that is needed. I think the common opinion is that antimicrobial growth promoters is really misuse of antimicrobials. 
the antimicrobial redu uh, use reduction, that might be a future license to produce. Because we see changes in the legislative landscape, but also will be happening in, in, in your world. What we see in Europe is that uh, there is now new veterinary medicine regulation that says that there are, should be databases for antimicrobial use per species, only prescription uh, when it's uh, when I'm prescription by a vet, no internet trade of uh, uh, prescription only uh, medicines, and the ban of use of certain antimicrobials for animals. So we are in Europe, we are becoming more and more strict. And I'm working in, in, in global organizations and we are talking also with the, um, the World Trade Organization about uh, kind of an, what, what as a quality indicator, what for export of products, can we require absence of certain antimicrobial mechanisms like the carbapenemase produces? So it's not yet implemented, but we are for, for, the, for the products, but we are talking about it. And then when we come to low and middle income countries, <clears throat> but I said we are doing quite some work in Indonesia where we had a survey on uh, broiler farmers, where we asked them for what they used in the last flock that they raised on their farm. And as you can see on this uh, picture, what they used in these uh, last flocks was, uh, now many of them used androfloxacin, uh, second is amoxicillin, also with a combination of cholestin. And when you think that the, the androfloxacin and the cholestin are antimicrobials that are uh, considered by WHO and other global organizations, are critically important for human use. And in fact, we should not use them in animal production. So what we see here is that uh, the, the current uh, use of antimicrobials is not what we like to see. And it's also that they use, um, from the questionnaire, we, we know that they are using a lot of antimicrobials prophylactically. And so, of course, for treatment, and this is not 100% because they're using them in one flock for both reasons. But the prophylactic use, that is, that is huge. And also important, that's an, an in fact, other story with that are, that are the residues that remain uh, when you treat antimicro uh, with antimicrobials. And uh, uh, farmers, 90% farmers, has only less than five days where they consider, say, for the withdrawal time. Now, and that's uh, also questionable. So then it's not only resistant organisms, but also the residues. And who is in Indonesia, who is influencing uh, uh, the treatment? Um, so 75% of the advice came from the technical uh, staff of supply uh, companies and 25% of this group of people. Um, from the technical staff, uh, there is only 6% is a vet. And in that other group, uh, there is um, uh, almost half of them is a vet. But what you can see is that there is a lack of professional advisors on, uh, on these farms. When, they, when it comes to the advice of the use of antimicrobials. So the challenges in low and middle income countries are, are huge. Uh, there is a question about the, the knowledge and, and awareness. Um, that's of, of farmers, that they, they are not aware that when you use antimicrobials in your flock, because it's good for that flock, that it might have a negative effect on the next flock that they have, because then you have still the resistant microorganisms and you can have treatment failures. So uh, it's also one of the pillars of the uh, World Health Organization uh, Global Action Plan that we should work on in improvement of knowledge and awareness. What we see a lot in lower middle income countries is the systematic use of antimicrobials. When you get the day old chicken, there is already a list on what day you should treat with what antimicrobial. And that's not what we call the prudent use of the, the antimicrobial stewardship, because it's not that the animals need maybe the treatment at that moment, but it's just that you do it because of it, it's, an, uh, it's uh, in, the, in the guidance how to use them. And, but it's an absolute wrong use. Another thing is the over-the-counter availability. So um, everybody can buy the antimicrobials and there is, there is no, no limit for farmers to use them. When you go to farms, I think when it comes to the prevention 
of the usage and of, of animal health, the, the improvement of animal health. I think a lot can be done on biosecurity, on environmental conditions, and on the health status of the animals. Enforcement of regulations in countries. Some countries have huge numbers of regulations, but they never enforce the regulations. So still farmers are quite free to, to do what they like with antimicrobials. And in fact, in many countries, we do not know what is, what, uh, how bad the situation is with antimicrobial resistant and, and uh, usage and the residues in animals. I said bad because we know from, from pilot studies that there is really a lot of antimicrobial resistance in these countries. And uh, what is missing is the, I think the professional advisors, the para-veterinarians, the veterinarians, who really can say this is, an, this is not a bacterial infection, this is a viral infection, or this is a more digestion disorder, uh, and you do not need an antimicrobial. And finally, in this long list, is uh, the substandard uh, veterinary services. So um, if you want to do uh, diagnostics, for example, there are no services. So there are a lot of problems uh, to solve. But there is also good news. And um, that is a picture from, from my own country, from the Netherlands, where uh, over about a decade, the picture is from 2007 to 2019, we managed to reduce the antimicrobial uh, sales in, uh, in animals a lot, with 70%. This is for the whole animal production, so not uh, split up uh, for uh, animal species. Um, we had a an, an ban on uh, antimicrobial growth from water in 2007, but parallel to the reduction in antimicrobial usage, you see a reduction in antimicrobial resistance in this picture, where we looked in the resistant levels in commensal E. coli, so in the, uh, the gut E. coli from, from chicken, and for different antimicrobials, and that are these, these different colors of the lines. But most important from this picture is that the lines are going down, what means that the resistance they, it disappears um, or at least decreases when you have less antimicrobial use in your animal population. Now, we, the, the uh, Wageningen Economic Research Institute asked uh, 21 of the farmers in the Netherlands, the broiler farmers, what they have done. Uh, over the, in this time period when there was a, a huge reduction of antimicrobial use. And what you can see is that they improved a lot of things. So it's really multifactorial, improved cleaning and disinfection, uh, worked on the uh, all in all out system, the drinking water hygiene, climate control. A very important was uh, go to slower growing uh, segments. So animals that uh, are a little bit older when they are slaughtered, breeding conditions and vaccinations. And, in fact, the, the outcome of that is that uh, they were able to avoid the prophylactic use of, uh, of antimicrobials. I thought that is, I think, a picture what shows that you have to do a lot of things, but there are options on farms to, uh, to do that. And what exactly the contribution of the different uh, factors are, that is not uh, clear. Before I come to my conclusions, the, the point about the sustainability of the uh, resistance mitigation. What you see in low and middle income countries, there is a balance in, in particularly the Ministry of Agriculture and in the production sectors for other priorities, food and mouse disease, the, the African swine fever that takes a lot of attention at the moment, even influenza. So when it comes to the balance of where are the costs and what investments you have to do, uh, you see that uh, th these diseases uh, with, with huge outbreak in the short term, um, they, they get more attention than antimicrobial resistance. I think we have to be clear about the One Health and the antimicrobial resistance uh, and, and talk about clear expectations. When we reduce the use in animals, uh, we will not solve the problem at the human side. We will contribute it. And I think we, it's, what I said, it's it remains so important to talk uh, with, uh, or that veterinarians talk with uh, medical doctors. But we should not uh, tell farmers from if you do this, then we will see a huge effect in humans because that's probably not what we can expect. And that's important for the motivation. And we, I think we have to educate them about that. And that's also important, I think, for the legislation. 
what I said, I believe in an investment of improvement of animal health, sustainable investment of, of for alternatives and reduced use. That is also in the FAO Global Action Plan objectives. And what we see is that there are changing consumer preferences and that will definitely, that will remain, that will increase the uh, customer demand, the higher value product for the critical consumers, like Gordon already uh, uh, explained. So the take home messages and points for that we can discuss now is um, the good news is that when we have less uh, um, usage in animals, we see also less resistance in commensal E. coli in the animals. The effect in humans is uh, for the E. coli is not very well described, but as I said, for foodborne uh, pathogens, I, I cannot enough stress that, is uh, there we see an effect. And then there is still the question, what the effect is in the, in the animal pathogens. We have indications that also there we see an, 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 a clear reduction. The lower middle income countries are behind and uh, the ability to make change is strongly dependent on the social, economic and cultural situation. There is not for, for, for the, the globe, there is not one solution. For producers and farmers, the question has to be answered, what's in for me and what are the cost of alternatives. A, gap, a, a, a huge gap is still what is the economic impact of antimicrobial resistance and we, we really we, we do not have clear uh, values there and it's also uh, very, uh, very much influenced by the context. And uh, I think there is currently a lot of attention for antimicrobial resistance uh, but um, I hope that uh, it also remains on the radar for uh, in, in more long term so that it will be a sustainable attention that we can keep because that's good for animal health and for public health. Thank you for your attention and this is the group that I'm working with. So. Great, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wagner. That make, we can then um, uh, move to the, can you, we have the webinar session now, the Q&A session. Um, if we um, move there, you can add more questions. We have a good amount of time left to address uh, your questions. We had already some of them coming in. So I would like to um, open up the floor to my to the presenters and my colleague uh, panelists to, um, to ad start addressing these. Yurik, you go first. Let's let's start with Gordon as a guest of our, our webinar today. So Gordon. Otherwise, okay, I'll, I'll go first, no worries. Um, there was one question, um, if there are good experiences of going ABF in low income countries, which is a very <clears throat> interesting question. And um, I think we cannot really answer this question generally, but it depends really on the demand side. Um, there are broiler integrators in low income countries which produce for export markets like Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, or even global restaurant chains. These countries have very specific requirements for the meat import, which then obviously needs to be matched by the producer. And these requirements often include ABF or at least with reduced antibiotics. And uh, the integrator then needs to set up a production system which will enable them to produce ABF or uh, with reduced antibiotics. And that is possible even in low income countries if you really plan ahead and uh, set up the right production system. And um, so I would therefore answer this question. It's really the demand of ABF which drives 
the integrators to produce it. Um, for domestic consumption in low income countries, I would say it's still a niche, but it's definitely a growing market, growing opportunity for us, uh, example, uh, in Thailand. Thank you. Um, I would like to take the next question, um, which came from Ron Ake. Um, he asked us how realistic do you think no antibiotic ever can be on a global scale? And when may we expect acceptable low levels in so-called developed markets? It's a great question. Um, uh, I, I want to emphasize here that um, no antibiotic ever, because really the, um, the, the let's say, um, yeah, the final um, objective that might be achievable in some markets, like in the US, it already is to some extent today, um, but that it is not, it is not yet um, realistic for most of the developed market, develop, uh, let's say, developed market, oh, sorry. Um, so what I would like to say, I mean, his question is about low levels of use in the so-called developed market. So in the, in, the, in, in the Western market, I think that um, when do we expect acceptable levels is really dependent on, on, on a conversation that we as an industry need to have with legislators and with retail. And it's uh, because even once you have sharply reduced your antibiotic use, the, the conversation continues on what is acceptable. We feel as a company, Edo Nutrition, that some use of antibiotics to, um, uh, in the case of uh, disease is acceptable because it, it, it guarantees that the welfare and the health of the animal is maintained. So that, so that is, um, to, that will, to some extent, you will always have some level which we feel can be considered as acceptable. So a real disappearance of antibiotic use on a global level, even in the development market, I don't see that as, a, as the end goal. There will be some a production uh, that is actually produced without antibiotic in the supermarkets and in the and in the restaurants, but it will be. Uh, it, I think it will always be part of a, um, a broader production uh, system that every now and then will require some antibiotic treatment still. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, we'll if I could take one now, uh, Jurek, the uh, one of the questions is: uh, Do investors study future consumer preferences? If yes, how? Well, uh, of course, in the USA, they are uh, very, very lucky that there is so much information that's available that we don't have anywhere else in the world. So you have constantly have presentations by uh, people like IRI from Nielsen, et cetera, which are constantly, and especially these days with everybody looking at post uh, uh, COVID. So, but one thing that is interesting today, a lot of consumers take for granted that it is antibiotic free. It is not something they would look at to, to take their decisions today, apparently. So the investors study this uh, uh, future consumer preferences, uh, not just for antibiotic, but for, for everything. So uh, I wish we were so lucky in Europe and in the rest of the world. Good. Um, let me take another question here. Um, there was one question from uh, Mr. Riedberg about uh, why better grow increases prices with 50%, although the extra cost is between five to seven. So 50% price reduction does not seem realistic. Um, I, the five to seven is a um, kind of um, uh, research that was done on the, on the app, on the uh, removal of antibiotics free and, and and this was a real case study where this impact was estimated based on that so i think that i, I i'm expecting that for better grow to to um to create an antibiotic free uh, production chain particularly as this is still a very relatively small segment within their production that 
most probably initially their, their, their additional costs might be a little bit higher. There's also logistic costs involved there. And, uh, um, and I think they also are taking the opportunity uh, with the retailer involved here that to, to, to grow, to take a higher margin there and, and serve this niche market um, in a profitable way. And I think that is the advantage of um, being the, the first mover in a market and um, um, f- f- let's say matching the need of a, a, a subpopulation within the, con- within the consumers and uh, um, uh, getting, getting paid for the, uh, um, for, the, for the transition into this different segment. And I think the early movers have a little bit more of an opportunity to, to benefit here. Of course, you always have to um, adjust your um, offer to the actual demand. The demand has to be real. And I understood uh, in early conversation with Gordon that this is really relatively new. And yeah, I mean, we don't have the data on the size of that um, uh, um, movement or the niche, how big that niche actually is. But typically you would expect that is if a niche grows to become uh, bigger and bigger and maybe stops to be, to be a niche market, Definitely, these uh, these increased prices will 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 th- uh, these these higher margin will disappear, will will not disappear but reduce sl- sharply. I think that's what from the U.S. market you're hearing that non-antibiotic ever starts to become um, a kind of an expectation for for particular uh, market segments at least. Maybe I can uh, ask a question. I see a very interesting question from Heinrich Kleine Klausing. Um, uh, I pointed out that the solution for farmers is not replacement of antibiotics by one single alternative additive or product. Does it need a holistic approach to win the battle? What are from your point the experience uh, the most important success factors producers should consider in management and feeding? That's a very complicated factor. And I think um, <clears throat> what you what you see is that um, uh, when you go to farms and when you see when they treat with antimicrobials, it's indeed it's not simply that you can say okay replace your antimicrobial with product X or or or, or, or B or whatever. Um, but I think that that comes really to that increase of animal health. Uh, with and you have to look, for example, in poultry critically to the vaccination scheme. Uh, what is really important, the feed quality, um, and I think also the, the biosecurity. And I, I, when, you, when you ask me to rank them, I think that is really difficult. And that also, I think, depends on, um, on where you are. And in, on some farms, when they, are, when they have quite some good attention already to the uh, vaccination uh, regime and on their farms, then that point is done and you can go to, to other points. So it's, it's, it, it's hard to... To really to point them out and to say, okay, you have to do this in in a ranking uh, for and start with this and then that one and that one. But it is really that you have to look for for different points, and I think that's also where uh, a veterinarian or a paravet comes in that have an, 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 a broad view on what points you in general uh, should look over. So I think it's it's not diff- not easy and maybe impossible to. To give a clear ranking what is the most important one because it depends also on the setting where you are and that's why i think you need professionals to 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 give uh, supervision on these farms okay I, I would like to address the problem uh of pores from panama especially as pores are very interesting especially with uh, china now uh, importing a lot so you have pores at well over three thousand dollars a ton and you have an amazing situation in domestic market in Thailand where you can buy a, a kilo of skinless boneless breast, which is a really premium product for $1.60, $1.70, and a kilo of paws costs you over $3. So I can assure you that in the production side, um, the where we used to have to uh, keep on to people about uh, their level of... Uh, of um, Paul issues. We don't have to bother anymore because everybody is so aware. To give you some idea, one one Paul now is about three U.S. cents. 
Um, so one of the key things that people look at every day is how many problems they had. But unfortunately, the, it's, it's, there are many factors which affect the uh, chicken paw uh, quality. And I don't think there's any one study yet, uh, uh, maybe Yap knows of something, uh, that demonstrates that um, antibiotic reduction actually increases uh, the, the pore problem. Yeah, I'm, I, I cannot add to that because I do not know the details there. And as a scientist, I'm very careful with saying something about it. <laughs> Let, let me take maybe the next uh, two questions. There were two questions from uh, Ms. Uh, Arichaya and uh, Mr. RJ Boyar about intervention and cost of interventions to replace uh, antibiotics or AGPs. Um, I don't really want to give you an exact dollar amount because it just would be wrong to, to put a dollar amount uh, to the cost how to replace antibiotics or AGP. But we as a company, we would advise interested producers to review the production system together with a partner like EW Nutrition to really identify the challenges in their system, why there is a need to use AGPs or antibiotics for treatment, and then find a holistic approach to strengthen the production system to replace antibiotics. And this then can lead, even in our experience, to similar cost per kilogram meat produced than before. Um, yeah, I can take one question. Uh, there was uh, a question on the use of uh, alternatives uh, and antibiotic replacement from uh, Rue Alexandre Goncalves. Um, so, uh, the story, the question is regarding the current antibiotic replacement, we're mostly looking at high purity natural compounds like essential oils. And do you think that bacteria may gain resistance against these natural compounds? So um, I, I, they have a different uh, mode of action than antibiotics do, where antibiotics are typically developed to through a bacterial cycle or bacteriostatic effects to really disenable the uh, the bacterium, the, the specific, the target, the, the pathogen, or other bacteria to to function and to survive. Um, uh, most of these uh, uh, natural components or phytomolecules are um, they are they they might at high concentrations have a bacterial uh, static effect, but um, a lot of their effect in the typical amounts used in feed are more um, influencing the behavior of the bacteria and um, um, that they are, let's say, in their, in their behavior, the bacteria become less pathogenic to the host. So in that sense, they are less likely to, uh, to provoke uh, um, resistance because they're not killing the population. And they typically, many of these products have multiple... Uh, um, multiple uh, active components within them. So they have more, um, more uh, mode of actions in attacking the, um, the, the bacteria. Some of these mode of actions actually are more targeted towards the host so that also the host becomes more resilient to these, uh, to these challenge conditions by altering the oxidative, improving the antioxidative capacity of the host cells at, 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 at intestinal level mostly, but also uh, um, enabling their um, immune system to be more responsive. So that in that sense, I think it is, it is not uh, so easy. You cannot, although they are replacing antibiotics, they do function in an in a, in a entirely different way. And so far, there is not, um, there's no any cases that will have let's say, resistance problems through the, through the application of that, that type of products. Um, a question there for, here from Steve Pullman on better growth strategy. Um, maybe I was a little bit unfortunate. I, I took two products from the shelf. And uh, yes, uh, you, you said they are the less healthy products, bacon, wings. Uh, but actually, they are they are selling all parts of the bird. So, the, so, so they will have breasts and they will have legs and et cetera. Now, um, I'm afraid then we start to mix that uh, you should not eat parts of the chicken uh, 
when really the, the presentation is all about ABF. But uh, I, I will pass that along to my friends at Better Grow your uh, observations. Uh, can I get a question from uh, Caroline Macking? Uh, when animals get sick in an NAE system, do you kill them all? I, it, I like the question because uh, that has to do also with animal health and animal welfare. Um, I think there is no need to kill them uh, because there is still a market for animals that have been treated and, and they still they are safe. Um, uh, so they go to another stream of uh, of production and another stream of product, but they lose uh, value in that sense. Uh, but there is definitely no need to call them all. And there was a question about... Uh, from uh, he already got an answer from for another question from Tuan Rui Alexandre Goncalves. Um, the very interesting point of antimicrobial use for prophylaxis, however, this is king of distinguished way to use growth promoter, right? Can you further explain the use of antibiotics as prophylactic? So, what I think you, you mean is that, uh, with the ban of growth promoters, people are using still uh, antimicrobials. Um, as, uh, but then they say, I use it prophylactically, and they use it more or less uh, to replace the, the growth promoter. And that's uh, why I think you, you need really the, the legislation uh, to, to have improvement there, like we have in the Netherlands since uh, 2013, where we are not allowed to use um, antimicrobials uh, preventively. So there has to be a diagnosis uh, from a veterinarian and it, uh, it can be an, an, uh, a diagnosis for, uh, you, you do not need to culture for it, but it has to be a diagnosis from a professional uh, to, uh, to prescribe antimicrobials. So uh, in that way, you are not allowed to use antimicrobials in, an, uh, in a preventive way. And so and you, you cannot use them in that way to, to use them as a replacement for, uh, for a growth promoter. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I would like to um, close the uh, webinar with these uh, questions. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there are questions that are still unanswered in the, in the Q&A box here. I apologize for not being able to deal with, uh, with all the, them during the, the session. However, we will be more than happy to, um, to pick them up, uh, uh, by, pick up our conversation through email. And um, if, if, if it's okay, yeah, you will, you see here the um, email address uh, webinar at ewnutrition.com where you can email the questions that you wish that you would like us to address. And then we will, they will be routed to us to, so we can provide you with an answer. Um, also the recording of this webinar will be made available on our website tomorrow afternoon, um, European time. And then um, thanks to our guests here for their insightful presentations and to uh, answering all these questions. And thank you for your attending attendance and for your questions today. Stay safe and keep up the good work. Bye for now. And we hope to see you back in the next um, version of our um, new newly started AMR webinar series here. So looking forward to, uh, to see you all again. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye bye.